uh, our topic of the week, focusing on quant funds. Not many people understand what's involved in a quant fund process. Tonight, Grant Irvin Smith from Investec Asset Management, who is a portfolio manager for quant funds there, will aid us in distinguishing between traditional approaches to asset management and what's involved when a quant process is, is at a play. Uh, so joining us now from Cape Town, Grant Irvin Smith, as I said, portfolio manager at Investec. And here in our Johannesburg studio, we've got our two strategists, Kobe Lakranji, strategist at Clickers Gray Investment Managers, and Roland Rousseau, equity strategist from Absa Capital. Welcome uh, to the show, gentlemen. So let's start off uh, with Grant in Cape Town, because Grant, uh, quantitative analysis and quant funds uh, are becoming more mainstream. So talk to us about the shift towards this more scientific approach that's being used in uh, portfolio construction. Uh, thank you, Samantha, and thank you for having me on the show. Um, I think quantitative investing has been around for some time, and it, it's gained a lot of traction uh, in the offshore markets, but in South Africa it's been very slow. Um, there's you know, a minority of uh, funds are run on a quantitative basis, and I'd say probably less than 3% of the equity uh, money in South Africa is managed on a quantitative basis. So should I, maybe I should just go into exactly what the differences are between traditional and quantitative funds. Right, so Grant, we've got two graphs here. So let's start off on the traditional approach because we can break down uh, kind of what uh, the, the portfolio managers traditionally do here in South Africa because as you say, that's pretty much uh, dominates the market here. And then we can go on to how quantitative uh, fund management differentiates itself. Perfect. So if you look at that first chart, hopefully you've got it up there. Um, the traditional investment process is We'll put it this way, any investment process is really about decision making. We get access to uh, an information set, we need to make sense of that information set and then make decisions. If our decisions are good, we should generate good performance in the portfolio. So in the traditional model, the decision making process is purely done by, by human beings and for that reason maybe it's instructive to just think a little bit about how the brain actually works. And now there's a wealth of research about this and I'll just delve into it briefly. Um, so neuroscientists have discovered that there are two distinct ways that we make decisions. Uh, what they call this is the dual process of thought theory. Now the first one and the, the default one if you like is called the X system. The X system is instinctive, you could almost call it gut feel if you like, and it's very much driven by emotion. Um, and this resides in a part of the brain that's evolutionary, that's much older in evolutionary terms than, than the front part of the brain where we make rational decisions. So to give you an example, um, if you're looking at a snake in a, through a glass, you know, in a cage like in a zoo, um, and that snake rears up to strike at you, your immediate response would be to jump back and the reason you do that is because your, your X system, your primitive brain, gives you the fear response and you immediately jump back. Later on, the rational part of your brain says, well, hold on, there's actually glass between me and the snake, there's no danger. But that signal is much slower in being processed than the, than the primitive part of your brain. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the danger in, in decision making in, in not only investment terms, but any decision making you make is because this X system is, is dominant. Um, most decisions are made with this. We, we make hundreds of decisions every day. We don't have to think about them consciously and often we don't even know we're making these decisions. To use the, what they call the Y system, which is more about logical reasoning, you use the front part of the brain, the frontal cortex, and it, it takes deliberate effort. So it's not the, the default decision making process. Yeah. So, so of course that really is uh, you know representative and you've got it we've got it up as system system here representative of quant uh, analysis and quant fund construction. So, so I'm just going to bring it back to studio here, Grant, and just bear with us because uh, uh, Roland, in in terms of your understanding of quantitative analysis, I mean, uh, how is the market accepting the, the role that it plays? I mean, what do you see as the role in terms of being able to deliver superior returns? Well, the implication of what Grant is saying is very important because it's saying that if most people are using um, emotional 
decision making in their in their investment process, then the, the market as a whole is quite emotional, and we're seeing a lot of evidence of that. But uh, what it, what graphs uh, what these graphs also uh, summarise for me is that uh, have you noticed that accountants scratch the back of their heads when they're confused, and statisticians scratch the front of their heads when they're confused? But uh, it basically just says that uh, there's far less money being managed on a very uh, mechanistic rules based kind of way it's all sort of I go and see management and it's a soft kind of approach as to do I like the people that I'm investing in do I like the process and I think that that uh, there is definitely a, a shift happening globally where people are wanting more objective scientific ways to, to look at in the investment process. So, so what is the mechanism then grabbed of uh, constructing a portfolio using quantitative analysis? Well I think the key thing is if you look at that second chart um, what we do is we take the, try and take the emotion out of it, as Roland has said, and we put a computer in the place there. So now you've got a, a process where you distance yourself from the market so you don't get pulled into the emotion of the day-to-day -day investing. We know there's a lot of emotion. I mean, Keynes called it the animal spirits. People talk about fear and greed. Those can have, you know, if you make intuitive decisions or if you make decisions that feel right, they feel comfortable, you're using that X system. You know, often the best trades don't feel comfortable, they don't feel right, and they, so it's difficult to implement manually. So what we want to do is let a computer do the day-to-day -day, uh, implementation. It's not to say the computer has a mind of its own. We program the computer, but we do it in a time when we can st step back from the market, think rationally, reason carefully, use techniques like statistical analysis, mathematical modeling. Then we program that into the computer. And that is very much a C system process. I mean, it's very difficult. You can't program a computer by gut feel. It's a very, you know, very much a process of logical yeah. reasoning and deduction. So it makes you think very carefully about how your investment process is going to work. And you think about every detail and then you, you let the computer do the day-to-day -day, uh, trading, if you like. Yeah. And the I other thing, so there's two important things. The one is it takes the emotion out. The other is, um, it's just much faster. I mean, the volume of information that we receive on a daily basis grows, is growing exponentially. So it's now just not possible, especially on a, on a global scale, to process all of that information manually. So I'd be very surprised if any uh, global investment process doesn't have some element of quantitative analysis somewhere in that process. Mm -hmm. Robert Schill has done some, some work on this and of course he's just won a Nobel Peace Prize uh, for uh, his work in uh, asset management and lo looking at asset prices but specifically looking at some of the drivers of, of share prices. Yeah, essentially. I mean, d just, just before we look at Schiller and the impact he's had on markets, I think the important thing here to remember is that the velocity of information that is available in markets today is just increasing phenomenally. You know, you could be sitting in a morning meeting in a, in a professional asset management business and everybody around the, t uh, around, around the table will have an opinion about a stock or a certain asset all based upon data that they've collected or based upon, uh, you know, uh, some work that they've done or, you know, and that could be based on historicals, it could be based on forecasting and there's a huge amount of data that kind of just gets hit into the faces of investment management teams on a daily basis. Here we've got a system whereby, in essence, people are saying, well, if there's a, if, could, we, could we create a, a, a computer-based system where we know that from a historical perspective um, you've got a whole bunch of factors that could potentially when put together you could actually derive a proper investment outcome and proper returns from those and really speaking the, f the father of that and the starting point of that was, was Schiller and if you have a look at your screen right now you'll f be familiar with the fact that he won uh, the, the Nobel Prize in Economics uh, about two or three weeks ago. He shared that pri prize maybe with, his, uh, with, with somebody that said something slightly different to what he did, which is Eugene Farmer. But in essence, what Schiller was talking about is that sentiment drives the markets in the short term and that it's very, very difficult for you to model sentiment. We know and we understand that there's a value effect in the market and we understand that the value effect is very, very important in the market. But no, how do you model sentiment yeah. and how do, you, how do you go about doing that? And, and Roland, I mean, you've done some work on this. I mean, what have the past few years taught us about some of the drivers of returns in the market? Well, if you think of the market being either rational or irrational, and Schiller is saying that there's more irrationality than rationality, which differs from the original view that everyone is rational when they invest, 
um, means that we've got to look at different drivers. And Grant will, will take us through some of them, but one obvious one is momentum. So in the last three years, value investing, which is sort of a, a Warren Buffett kind of style of investing, has, hasn't really performed that well. So another type of driver, which is irrational over-optimism in terms of the markets just keep going up and up and up without the fundamentals justifying it necessarily means that this is a valuable source of excess return. So a quantitative process, um, and Grant might not call it momentum, but uh, that, that sort of can be captured with technical analysis or, or, or sentiment kind of indicators. Yeah. Grant, which ones do you look at when it comes to sentiment? Uh, the strongest indicator for us on sentiment is to look at what sell-side brokers are doing with their earnings forecasts. Uh, you know, are they becoming more optimistic on the company? Are they increasing their expectations or are they, you know, decreasing their expectations? And there's a lot of different techniques and models that we can build around that. And that actually proves to be one of the most powerful sentiment indicators that we use. The other one, as you said, is, is simple technicals, which uh, a lot of people don't like to admit that they use, but you know, from a quantitative perspective, if something works, no matter how simple, we will use it. Yeah. Well, Grant, uh, we are going to be getting into more depth in terms of the Investec Active Quant Funds here. So just just start on the sentiment side of things right now. I mean, of course, a sentiment at various times in the cycle will have more more of a force in terms of driving uh, market movements. So, so did you change uh, the weightings perhaps to the various elements uh, that, that you use to assess a stock on? And for example, sentiment, I mean, does it become more or less important at certain times in portfolio construction? Uh, yes, we do change the, the weights we, we allocate to each of these styles dynamically over time uh, because we want to try and, you know, we acknowledge that the market goes through different moods, if you like. Sometimes it favors value, sometimes growth, sometimes momentum. So we want to try and pick up on that and, and tilt our models towards what's currently in favor in the market. Uh, when does sentiment work best? If we break it down into the two simple components, sentiment and value, uh, sentiment works pretty well most of the time. The times when it doesn't work is when there, is, when there are very big reversals in the market, like 2008, for example. When you get market you know, crises, then because sentiment is, is strongly linked with momentum and it is, um, relies on sort of autocorrelation and trending, whether it be in earnings or prices, sharp turning points you know, do cause some pain for quant investors. Mm -hmm. Typically. 